So today it's my pleasure to introduce Ross Nepper, uh, visiting us from Cornell University, where he's the director of the Robotic Personal Assistance Lab. Uh, and there they work on some of the really kind of most difficult challenges in human-robot collaboration of social navigation uh, and actually getting robots to assemble IKEA furniture with you, which I think is like one of the grandest of grand challenges in HRI. Um, and what I love about Ross's work is that he really dives deep into the kind of foundational algorithmic underpinnings of human-robot collaboration. Um, and whereas I think a lot of people focus either on the core robotics of kind of action, like how do you get robots to do stuff, or kind of the purely communicative, like social, how do you get robots to communicate effectively, I think Ross is really working on this sort of grand unified theory of action and communication and kind of, you know, how does action itself implicitly convey uh, so social signals and, and things like that. So I'm really excited to hear what he has to say today, and I'll hand it over to Ross. Thank you, Sean. I'm very excited to be here. Thank you so much for having me. Um, so something that most people don't know about me, uh, unless you dig really deep into my history, is that uh, in addition to my degree in robotics and my degree in computer science, I also have a degree in history. Um, and so I like to, from time to time, dig into that and, and sort of use my history side to, to look at robotics and actually uh, try to understand where are we going historically and look at that trajectory going forward. So I want to start with an allegory, actually. So this is a story about robotics uh, told through the lens of 19th century American history which was all about westward migration. So American progress, this idea that uh, manifest destiny, American citizens, the American nation is destined to conquer all of the land of the American continent from coast to coast, right? Uh, never mind that there were already people here, you know, this is, this is the European story for the moment, right? So there's this frontier, right, which is moving westward throughout the 19th century. And on the frontier, settlers would, uh, through the Homestead Act, could, could claim 160 acres from the federal government for free as long as they settled the land, farmed the land, developed the land, uh, raised their family, uh, and lived basically by themselves, right? There would be neighboring homesteads and so on, but this was their property. They planted their own personal flag on it and developed it. And that's really where robotics has been. We've been on the frontier. We've had this frontier mentality for all of this time. Uh, and what does flag planting mean when we talk about robotics? It means, I'll use my own work here as an example. It means I'm the first to build IKEA furniture with robots, right? So a lot of the research that we see in robotics in, coming out of academia is of this nature. I'm the first to do X. Um, and it's exciting. Right? I got to be the first. I mean, this is a fun project. Um, and a lot of times, I think this work gets cited. This is a fairly he heavily cited work. And I think it's oftentimes people do, do applications like IKEA furniture. Right, That's sort of just this passing thing. Um, but what does that contribute? Right? I mean, we can talk about, well, it's a distributed furniture assembly system involving heterogeneous robots that have to jointly plan uh, from first principles. They're given only CAD files of the parts annotated with whole information. They have to construct a blueprint. They have to come up with a task plan. They, they use their tools uh, in special ways. Um, so there's an interesting multi-agent robotics story here. Um, and this, for me, was guided by what kind of tasks humans need to do. We not only loosely collaborate, like you saw before, but also tightly coordinate our motions uh, to do things like physical interaction. Uh, and so underlying this, there's a lot of themes that informed my future work in HRI that, that came after this. Um, so inevitably, we run out of land on which to plant flags, right? Eventually, uh, the frontier reaches the West Coast, right? Um, this, is, this actually formally occurred in, in 1890. The US Census Bureau announced the frontier is closed. And what did they mean by that? They meant not that, of course, all of the land had been settled, but the best land had been settled. The frontier was no longer a contiguous thing, and it was now broken up 
right? Um, and if you look at the brown regions, that's the arable land. People preferentially settled where they could actually grow crops and, and you know, find water and so on. Um, and so if you have this flag planting mentality, you start out with a really great arable land, and eventually you end up settling in the very difficult areas like Nevada. I don't know if anyone here is from Nevada. I don't mean to pick on, but um, you know, it gets harder to, to find big contributions in robotics. And so I think that right now we're actually at this closing of the frontier, uh, metaphorically speaking, in robotics. And the reason for that has to do with corporate interest in, ro in engineering of robotic products, right? Suddenly we see billions of dollars are being invested uh, by companies, not only in self-driving cars, but in, uh, there's been a lot of attempts at doing social robots for the home. You know, manufacturing robotics has remained big over a long period. Um, so we're really at a tipping point where things look different. That doesn't mean that, that we can just hand off the robotics problem to industry and expect them to take care of it. Um, but it does mean that we might want to rethink how we in academia frame robotics research to some extent, right? So maybe we need to start looking at fewer larger problems like teamwork and coordination in HRI. Um, we should be replicating each other's results, which is historically something we're really bad at in robotics. Um, one of the things that underlies my work is this idea of, of it being a scientific endeavor. It's not about, can I build a thing that does some task? It's about, what are the principles that would guide me to build a thing to do that task? Um, and I've thought for a long time that I, I think we need to do a better job of developing metrics and benchmarks for, for these big robotics problems. Um, and you'll see later, uh, we don't have them yet. I think that's really a, largely an open problem. Um, so how can robotics contribute, academia contribute to industry? Here's, here's the Waymo car trying to merge into traffic. Um, so it's heavy traffic. I'm, many people here, no doubt, have faced this situation before. Uh, it's not easy to find that gap, although humans generally find a way to do it, right? It's not just waiting for the gap to open up, but it's really about making the gap open up. It's about acting in a way that forces the gap to open up, maybe by nosing into traffic a little bit or uh, speeding up and slowing down. Instead, what the Waymo car does is just it gives up and it exits. <laughs> right? So why couldn't it solve this? Uh, fundamentally, merging in traffic is a social problem. You're interacting with human beings who behave according to complex rules in a team. Right? All of the drivers of all of these cars together are a team on the road. Uh, who are united in their goal not to collide with each other and to all get to their own destinations. Um, so this is very similar to the social navigation work that I'm going to talk about a little bit later, uh, just at a higher speed. Um, and if you think of it as collision avoidance, uh, so this is basically collision avoidance plus some probably some inverse reinforcement learning. Um, it's going to look like a really hard problem if you don't understand what's going on under the hood. Um, another problem that industry has been working on, this is a very different flavor, um, which I mentioned because I'm also working on this game. Uh, so does anyone here know Hanabi, the card game? It's uh, DeepMind and Google have decided that after solving Go, this is the next big game that they want to solve. Right? So they claim this is harder than Go. And I'm going to show you, I don't have time to fully go into this, but I'm going to briefly talk, talk about the rules of the game. Uh, the key thing that makes it interesting, it's collaborative, and you hold your hand backwards. So you can see everyone else's hand, but not your own. And the goal is to play cards down on the table according to a certain set of rules. And since you don't know what's in your hand, you have to give each other hints in order to know what to do. You can give hints either about color, in which case you must hint all cards of that color, or likewise number, you must hint all cards of that number. Those are the only kind of hints, the only kind of information that you can give to your partner uh, to, to help them understand what to do, right? So I'm going to show you a really short clip of two people playing this game. Uh, so Claire says to her partner, this is a blue card, right? So she knows now the color, the color but not the number. Nevertheless, she says, so I'm just going to play it, right? That was incomplete information, you know, taken strictly. Uh, but this is a social game. And so she's reasoning about what was Claire's purpose in giving her this information. It must have been actionable. It must be that she wants me to do something with it, and she's not just telling me a random fact. Right? So again, 
<coughs> machines have a great difficulty solving this game because they're not thinking about it from a social perspective. They're not trying to solve a team problem yet. Maybe, maybe soon. Um, so today, this is the outline for my talk. I'm going to discuss three concepts and how they, they unify to give us teamwork. Um, so the first one is communication. And, and what I'm going to mean by this today is natural modalities, uh, sometimes multiple modalities at once. So these can be speech, gesture, eye gaze, body language, uh, facial expression. There's a, there's a whole bunch of them. And they all form an ensemble. Uh, and so they're, they're, each one of those individually has a whole conference dedicated to just doing you know, facial expressions. And I think that's unfortunate because when you merge them together, it actually makes the problem easier because they serve as context for each other. Um, so a lot of my research is about trying to do that whole thing at once in context of a real robotics problem. Um, and we can actually make a lot more headway. Uh, second category is coordination. Right, within the team. So this is really about consensus, synchronization, uh, decision making of the, the group. Uh, and the third one then is representation. And here we need a set of symbols. Uh, and these symbols are the grounding targets for our communica communication signals. Uh, and this, the symbols of the representation are what the consensus must be formed over. So we, as a team, have agreed on a plan or agreed on a goal when we can agree on a set of symbols in our representation. Uh, so today, I'm going to mention all three of these in the context of three different projects. Um, the first thing I'm going to talk about is team decision making. So how does team decision making happen by using communication to mediate coordination? The second one, which I'll spend most of the time on, is multi-agent social navigation. Um, and uh, thirdly, then we have uh, implicit communication uh, of actionable information, like what you just saw in Hanabi, where it's, it's not the literal, but the, the underlying uh, information that's being communicated. All right. So just to give you a sense of some, some applications to think about, you saw IKEA bot running by itself, but here it is in the context of an HRI user study. Uh, so this is a distractor task. This guy is just assembling this to, to uh, keep his mind off of the fact that the IKEA bot system is running in the wild behind the screen. But every once in a while, the IKEA bot will encounter a problem. And it will say, excuse me, and then it will ask for help. Right? So uh, in addition to natural language, uh, you also have some amount of gesture. It's sort of gesturing at the table. Um, and just the, the context is really a big clue for the user. And you notice that he finished up what he was doing. He was able to internalize the help request, finish it up, come around, and do a pretty smooth handoff from the uh, human to the robot. And then the robot says, thank you. We'll take it from here, sort of managing expectations. And they can both get back on their way. Um, that was a success case. Of course, it doesn't always look that beautiful, right? So I, I'm a believer in, um, you know, Tell, telling not just the beautiful success stories, but a lot of the other cases too. So this is sort of a, a weird case, because the robot, instead of giving a useful help request, it just says, please help me, uh, which seems rather uncooperative. And I'll come back to later why that was our baseline. Um, but the robot gives an unhelpful help request and then forces the human to go through a lot more effort. Um, he doesn't even know which robot it is that needs help. He doesn't know what help the robot needs. Uh, we primed him before the study with a few different kinds of things that he could try. And so he's just running down that mental list right now. Um, but eventually he realizes he's, he's looking to the wrong robot. And really, it was this other robot that needed help. And once he figures that out, it sort of clicks into place. Oh, well, you, maybe you can't reach this, right? So if, if, if I hand it to you, maybe you'll take it. Uh, and sure enough, that was correct. So this is interesting in that it was a success, but it was a very tedious success. This is going to be an outright failure. So here the robot gives a very unclear help request. Uh, eventually, the guy can't figure it out, and, and the robot times out. And it just says, never mind. I'll take it from here. Um, and you'll see the, the user is not at all pleased. Right? What, you mean no thank you? You dragged me away from my very important task that I was doing. You didn't give me useful guidance. You didn't answer my queries. And then you just dismiss me. Right? So um, this tells us HRI is hard, which I, some of us here knew already. Um, but more than that, it says that 
the team is really what, what's important here, right? The, the robot was neglecting the team aspect of this task. It was treating it as just, OK, I'm going to turn myself off, and you're going to solve the problem now. And that doesn't work. OK, one other application you can think about. So social navigation. Here we have the Beam robot. This is a telepresence robot, uh, but it's automated, and it's wandering through this crowd. It's just navigating uh, to waypoints. And you can see it's pretty awkward, right? It's cutting people off. It's exhibiting a general lack of responsiveness to people's behavior. That's weird. OK. Um, yeah, so not the way that we want our robots to behave, right? So I contend that this is as much a team problem as the last one. Uh, it's just that the teams form and uh, dissipate very rapidly. Um, and a lot of the goal setting is totally implicit, right? So you may, may not think about it as much, but it's just as much a team. Um, and all of the, these three themes apply. Um, so let's look a little bit more into what makes up team decision making. Uh, firstly, there's a lot of basis for this, both in, in social sciences and also in AI outside of robotics. People have been looking at teams for a long time. Um, the work of Bratman, uh, for example, on belief, desire, intention, BDI, and how that leads to and promotes teamwork. Um, Cohen and Levick uh, had a formulation for uh, how people set goals and then how teams set goals, uh, which involves having a consensus about the fact that a goal is established. Uh, and then it says that you're locked in and you're not allowed to get out of the goal until everybody on the team is aware that either it's impossible or it's, it's accomplished or it's no longer relevant. Right? Um, so this kind of engage, disengage, formal specification. Um, Herb Clark has also been a big influence on me. Um, he studies di dialogue, uh, but really he studies teaming, really. It's, it's, it's about how the, the dialogue, the natural language, is really uh, accomplishing something deeper. It's a joint activity. Um, and he's a lot of insights. I couldn't really list them all here. But one of the big ones for me uh, is that repair of failures is not an aberration. That is actually the mechanism that drives collaboration. Right? We don't sit down and plan out, here's how everything's going to go, and then execute open loop. This is how the loop gets closed. It's something goes wrong. Somebody says, hey, you're doing that wrong. Um, we said, see that in Hanabi all the time. People say, like, why did you discard that? And then they kind of, like, you're not allowed to talk about it, but people kind of say, no, trust me. Um, so people are quite good at th these kind of repairs, resiliency to, to failures, at, at promoting teamwork. And that's really the kind of things that I'm trying to understand here. Um, so we can think about teamwork as you have n agents and n plus 1 decision makers. right? So the team really is its own entity. Um, but it's a, it's a synthetic entity that somehow has to get produced by actions from the individual members. Um, and teamwork, you can think of it as a distributed systems problem. So I mentioned already that, that there's these joint actions that the team has to take in terms of forming consensus and synchronizing the timing of events. Um, and furthermore, that there's a lot of communication that happens. It's asynchronous. It's multimodal. Uh, and it's mostly implicit. So this is one of the big challenges, is that you need context. So we're talking about situated interaction. A lot of the stuff that people do cannot be done in the absence of the context, because you, it becomes ambiguous. Um, so that's really key to, to making all of this work, is the, the situated aspect. Um, going back to uh, the social navigation example, suppose this robot is navigating through a space, and there's some other people moving through the space. Uh, the people can observe the history of the robot, and maybe the robot is trying to plan a path that's going to be compatible with the motion of the people. Right? So this is a hard problem for the robot. Because firstly, there's an infinite number of possible future trajectories that the robot could follow. Um, so if it somehow wanted to communicate which trajectory it was picking, that's a geometrically speaking, that's a difficult problem. Um, secondly, people are reactive. So even if it committed and it said, this is going to be where I'm going to go, people might trample over the trajectory. They might do something that's going to change what the robot wants to do anyway. So there's really no point in over committing to, to a specific geometric trajectory in the first place. And turns out that's not what people are doing anyway. Um, so I put a robot 
but it could just as well be a person here. Um, so there's a team aspect and individual aspect to social navigation. Uh, but you'll see that the same structure exists in any team, teaming sort of problem. Uh, so on the individual side, when you're choosing a path, you're looking at the shape of the path and you're maneuvering, right? You're, you're signaling socially to the other agents. Um, so these are fundamentally individual decisions that you don't need buy-in from the other agents to do these things. Uh, on the other side, we have the team. So when I'm choosing a topology of my path, I'm choosing do I go right or do I go left, I can't do that by myself. I need buy-in from the other members of the team to achieve consensus about how are we going to avoid collision and get by each other. Right? So this fundamental structure uh, you'll see actually pervades a lot of these kind of tasks that we're looking at. Um, and you can look at it not just as a, as a binary individual versus team. Really, there's a spectrum where you might be making a decision that is partly individual, but it's, it's influenced by the team somehow. Um, and there's this duality where if it's a team decision, then it tends to be of a discrete nature. And if it's an individual decision, it tends to be more often of a continuous nature. right? Um, so that was the structure we saw here. And again, this is something that we're going to see across different problems. And the reason for this has a lot to do with communication bandwidth. So if you think about the spectrum of different tasks in terms of what uh, communication bandwidth, the modalities that you're using can support. On the one side, maybe you have natural language or gesture. Um, there's a lot of information, but there's also a lot of noise. So it's, it tends to be high ambiguity. Um, so if you're trying to clearly communicate in natural language, it often takes a lot of words to get a little bit of meaning, like which leg uh, are you supposed to hand me? Um, so that tends to be a fairly low bandwidth of, of communication. Um, on the opposite extreme, we have sort of physical HRI. Uh, you could think about the physical therapy. You could think about collaboratively moving objects. Uh, here, there's haptic feedback. So it's real time. It's, it's a, a very quick sort of uh, geometric type of uh, communication. And again, here we see a duality where if the communication bandwidth is high, then the feedback bandwidth is also high. You're able to very quickly close the loop if you're collaboratively moving a sofa. And so if we change our mind about where we're going to put the sofa, I can react almost instantly. Um, if we're doing this kind of uh, more you know, task planning style of collaboration, then we're going to see a much slower control loop, too. So if I say that, OK, I'm going to hand the screws to you, and you're going to screw them in, and then for some reason uh, we decide we're going to flip it around, it takes a while to agree that that's what we're going to do. Uh, and so that tends to be a much slower sort of feedback. Um, and, and aligned with that, we have this granularity of consensus, uh, which uh, mirroring what we saw before, if you have a slow feedback loop, uh, you're going to tend to have more discrete type of, of uh, consensus in terms of who does what or what order do we do things in and so on. Um, so I'm going to come back to these ideas later on in the talk. Um, but I want to impress on you that most of what the team state is that matters in terms of making these decisions is actually hidden. Right? The only thing that's observable is the actions performed by the team members and the context in which they're performed. Um, but if we're trying to understand and communicate goals, intentions, capabilities, that all is achieved implicitly through the communication. All right. So now we're going to switch to social navigation. Um, so we can think about sort of a multi-agent problem like this. Um, and this has been a work, uh, one of the major efforts in my lab over the past few years, trying to really crack the, the multi-agent social navigation problem. Uh, and we'll start with something really simple. So say we have two agents. And these two agents need to pass each other in the hallway, right? So, so often we'd go right. But you can also go left. That's fine, too. Um, but we need to, to decide, and we need to agree. So initially, if you're approaching somebody down the hallway, you might have a distribution over right and left. That's your representation. In this case, the representation is really simple. Um, but the problem is that, that it may be ambiguous, right? We may even disagree. So what happens is that you, you move a little bit, right? If you see somebody in the hallway, you, you nudge to the side, and maybe they nudge to the side. And then it becomes much clearer what's going to happen. 
So that motion that you just did, that's the communication aspect. So that would be legible motion, hopefully. Uh, and that clearly communicates your intention. Um, so the coordination is over these two things coming into alignment with each other. So it could happen that you both nudge to the same side, and, and then you need to sort of negotiate with each other until you agree on who's going to pass on which side of whom. So that's the two agent case. Uh, this is something that we all do every day. It seems very routine. Um, but the, the human capability for this certainly doesn't, is not limited to two people. So we've developed a, a, a way of modeling N agents, a representation that, that can handle, uh, that can scale nicely to N agents. Um, so here we, we assume there's some workspace, there's some path history that's been observed for all of the agents in the scene. Uh, and you'd like to predict what's going to happen and reason about that. Um, so we'll plot these trajectories of the agents in space-time. And then we're going to project onto the x-time plane. So we're going to get rid of that y-axis. Uh, but we're going to preserve the passings, so who passes in front of whom. And if we clean that up a little bit, it becomes what's called a, a braid in topology. So the braid group would be the set of all possible passings of n strings. Um, and that has an algebra. It, it, it forms a, a, an algebraic group, and it has this nice symbolic structure to it. Um, so we can enumerate the set of, of braids. In this case, I guess it's, uh, what, six braid. Um, and you can assign probabilities to these things. So you can say, you know, there might be hundreds of possible ways that six agents can avoid each other, but there's probably only three that seem worth considering at this point. Um, so we've done some machine learning to try to, to predict how agents are going to move through a scene, um, which I'm not going to go into the details of the, the engineering side of that. I'm happy to refer you to the paper, though, if you're interested. But, um, but we can actually predict. And more than that, we can influence. Um, so if, if I believe that you believe that one of these is a likely uh, outcome, I can make a legible motion that increases the likelihood that you're going to choose that one over the others, right? because this is really a collaborative thing. It's sort of like a dance that, that N agents are all doing together. So how do we think about this influence problem? Right? If I have a particular outcome that I want, I need to legibly co convey to you uh, what outcome I have in mind. That's the, the consensus building. So the way that we think of this is in terms of angular momentum. So if, if two agents move counterclockwise around each other, we'd say by the right-hand rule that they have a positive angular momentum with respect to the center of mass. And likewise, if they move clockwise around each other, we'd say that they have a neg negative angular momentum. right? And that's a nice concept, because you, you can maximize angular momentum. And that is the same as disambiguating. right? So if two agents are going straight towards each other, they have zero angular momentum. And the more they turn to the, the same side, the same direction, that maximizes angular momentum. Um, and the way that it does that is, is in two terms. First, there's from the center of mass, there's the radius out to the agent. Uh, increasing that radius gives us clearance, right? So that's one way that we maximize. Um, increasing the velocity gives us the ability to adapt. So we can change speed uh, to respond to what the other guy is doing. Um, and when you combine those, you have consensus. Because if the two are moving in a compatible way, then they're going to add their angular momenta. Uh, and if they're moving in, in sort of in opposite orbits, then they're going to cancel each other out. Right? Um, and that says there's no consensus. So this is an elegant way of thinking about pairs. Right? Um, we, and, and furthermore, we can manipulate momentum to convey intention, which is what we wanted to do. Um, now I'm going to formalize that another step, uh, which is going to give us the ability for n agents. A question? Yeah. Uh, the previous one, is there a law does it still work in the degenerate case where we're headed the same way? Where they're, where they're what? <clears throat> where we're headed the same way. So headed the same way, right. So if, you mean if you're headed straight towards each other? No, we're walking in the same or direction. That way. So if, if Let's you're, say one behind the other, right? The vectors are Oh, one. I see what you're saying. So just like right. walking in tandem through a doorway, that kind of thing. Right. Um, that would be zero angular momentum. So I think you wouldn't necessarily want to apply it in a, in that case because any um, I mean it, this would be for a case where you're trying to avoid a collision. Essentially, there's no decision to be made 
uh, if if you're walking in in the same direction, following each other. Is, I could run into you. Yeah. So are you saying like if one of them is faster slowing, the other, right. is faster? Okay. Um, Just with this. I was wondering if the framework carries. The yeah, it does. Um, we can I, offline if you want to go through the math in detail. We can sure. draw some pictures and, and see how it does work out. Um, yeah. Somewhat related. I'm wondering, have you guys thought through this framework and how it might generalize? So the current sort of formulation seems pretty geometric, you yes. know. And but let's say I have dominance relationships between people or other kinds of contextual information mm -hmm. that tells me about how people tend to behave. Interesting. Can you overlay yeah. layers like that on top of this? Yeah. And um, kind of create richer. Yeah, no. That's a that's a great question. Or like constraints, like you're pointing, like maybe yeah. a door, or yeah, yeah, yeah. I don't know, like other other kinds of either social or spatial constraints and how those. Great, it's a great question. I, I'm going to talk about the next section, and, uh -huh. and if I don't answer it, okay. please come back to me again. Um, so, this as an intuition, I think this is pretty good. Um, it, I think you can do better, and the reason is that. When you're talking about n agents, this gets messy because you're trying to add up all these angular momenta of all these, these agents. And if you imagine people moving through a train station or something, it's just it's chaos, right? Um, so we, we took it a step further. Uh, we wanted to have a more um, sort of physical dynamics-based approach to this. So um, if two agents are orbiting around each other, uh, which is the condition that we want, we can measure that angle. Uh, that they pass by each other, and we can compute a winding number. So if you pass through uh, pi radians, that would be a winding number of one half, right? So one winding would be going all the way around once back to where you started. Um, and so you can write a specification in terms of winding numbers. So if we just want to get by each other, that's plus one half or minus one half, depending on the, the uh, topology. Um, and it turns out if you have a braid, you can give the set of winding numbers pairwise for all of the agents. Um, going the other way, there's multiple braids because winding numbers, you don't, like, um, if I'm passing a bunch of people, say, in the audience, I don't really care about how you all are passing each other, too. Um, so it's not always a complete specification. But um, this tends to actually be more useful, uh, we find, in practice, because it scales much better uh, for the number of agents. So the, the winding number, which is going to be plus or minus a half usually. Um, and what we're going to do is formulate uh, what we call a vortex, uh, which is going to be a system whose natural dynamics are, rather than moving in a straight line, are going to be to move in an orbit. Um, and, and so we generate a Hamiltonian. Um, if you're not familiar with this, a Hamiltonian is basically an expression of energy. Um, so by regular uh, dynamics in physics, mechanics, um, we have conservation of energy, and we also have conservation of momentum. Um, and conservation of momentum means you're keeping your same velocity in a straight line. So what we want here is for conservation of momentum to carry you around in a circle. Um, and it turns out that you can, <clears throat> you can achieve that pretty, pretty easily. <coughs> Excuse me. Um, so I won't delve into the math in, in gory detail, but Essentially, a geodesic, that is the shortest path between two points uh, in, the, in the vortex, becomes following the circle. And inward or outward motion uh, would be violating conservation of momentum, but that can also be optimizing for other factors. Um, and so what we end up doing uh, is, is, in fact, combining them. So, so this was based on uh, the work of Berger from 2001. Um, we adopted it and showed in, in a robotics context that we can actually do it. Um, and so basically, you just integrate these dynamics, and that becomes your controller. Um, and you can close the loop by observing how others move and, and reacting and recomputing. It's super fast. Um, and compared with optimization-based approaches, it's much more reliable at uh, keeping the topology that you asked for. Um, so we actually spent years trying to get uh, trajectory-based optimizers to solve topology, and it's super hard. It just, I mean, it, that's, you know, we had, we had a negative empirical result. We were unable to do it. I can't say it's impossible, but um, when you get these complicated systems with a bunch of agents moving through a space, uh, it's very tempting for the optimizer to say, well, I'll just let these two pass on the wrong side. Um, whereas with this system, 
it naturally works because that's the natural dynamics of the system. Um, and so uh, what we do, we have the topological specification as a list of pairwise winding numbers. Uh, we feed that into our trajectory uh, generation system um, <clears throat> where the Hamiltonian gradients are repulsive potentials, right? They're, they're keeping the agents from colliding with each other. Um, furthermore, there's, there's act, uh, attractive potentials, which are the goals, right? You want the agents all to move toward their goal. Um, and it's very easy to add in other uh, terms here or to weight these terms differently. And I think this answers your question in terms of power dynamics. If there were, say, a first responder who's rushing through the room, um, you could just have him uh, repulse all of the other agents a lot more. Uh, and, and, and he doesn't react or reacts much more minimally to the other agents. Um, so uh, any other questions before I shift gears? I'm going to start talking about a user study. Yeah. yeah can you compare this with optimized based approaches? Did you compare it with uh, randomized path planners as well? Or do the results hold? Um, I don't know of a good way to do this given that it has to be reactive. Right. So. Randomized path planners. Well, with reactive replanning, I guess. Okay, so you're thinking like, um, like replan RRT at 10 yeah. hertz kind of thing. Right. Um, you could. So, so the way that that has been done most effectively. So Emilio Frizzoli has done a lot of work using RRTs for this kind of thing. Um, it it works well when you have dynamics, uh, because the dynamics actually constrain the solution space so that you don't get it wildly changing its mind every time it, it replans. Um, so I think that the two actually naturally combine nicely with each other. So if you wanted to do obstacle avoidance of, of static obstacles as well, um, that would be a fairly natural way to, to approach it. We didn't actually do a head-to-head -head comparison of this versus just an RIT. Because um, for a, you know, these are omnidirectional robots, at least the idealized model. So um, it would probably tend to bounce around a lot more. It's an interesting question. Anything else? OK. Um, so we're going to consider our sort of pastoral scene. This is our user study. Um, so a lot of people in HRI, when they do a user study, there's this tendency to want to, to prove your system is the best system. Um, and so oftentimes, people will pick something that looks like a straw man or something that um, maybe is, is somehow set in a way that uh, it's you know, predestined that their thing is going to look the best. Um, we wanted to take a more neutral stance and, we, and say, well, there's a lot of interesting systems out there. They all have pluses and minuses. So we try to design a user study with that philosophy in mind. Um, and I'm happy to, I, I will criticize it myself, and I'm happy to take other critiques as well. But So we have our Beam Pro, our telepresence robot, which is running autonomously in this room with these easels. The scenario that we tell the users is it's a factory. So they have to wear these hard hats, which have icon markers so that we can do motion tracking. Each user has one color marker and a different color sticky note pad. And the idea is that they have to go to a station to one of these easels, draw a box, and then if there's a, a, like a, a proper colored box already empty, then they can stick their sticky note in there. So that the point of the task really is to keep them running around from one station to the other and force a lot of close range, uh, interesting navigational interactions. Um, and it worked pretty well. So this is the, the kind of trajectories that we tend to see. Um, and uh, basically, they're just running from one easel to the next. They're, they're not, not allowed to go to adjacent easels, so they have to pick one that's across the center of the room. Um, and here's our baseline. So on the left, we have ORCA, uh, Optimal Reciprocal Collision Avoidance. This tends to be used a lot uh, for comparisons in, in when you're doing social navigation, uh, although it's not actually for social navigation. It's for, uh, it, I mean, it was developed in, in computer graphics for simulating large, like, evacuating a stadium-sized uh, model. So it's very quick and easy to compute. And basically, what it's doing is planning in, in velocity obstacle space. And it's looking for the minimal deviation trajectory that, that can safely get to the goal. Um, but it does assume that everybody else is also running ORCA. Um, so that's one of its flaws, is if somebody is running a different algorithm, all bets are off. And it might actually collide in that case. 
Um, the second one is our teleoperation. So we had a, a human teleoperator running the beam, um, just trying to smoothly navigate from one station to the next. Um, and then on the right is our uh, social momentum framework. Um, and I'll play this one again just so you can see it. Um, you get much more of an orbiting kind of behavior as you'd expect for the, the sort of natural dynamics of the system. Um, and we generated a list of hypotheses. Hypothesis generation for this sort of thing is actually quite hard because it's hard, you know, it's hard to say what good is even. Um, and you'll see that we actually struggle with this. So in close proximity, we want to say that ORCA generates the most geometrically efficient paths because it, devi it tries to deviate minimally. Um, social momen momentum generates the highest acceleration paths because it's trying to go in a circle, right? So we should see higher acceleration. Um, and then telepresence generates the most energy efficient paths because humans by nature uh, tend to minimize jerk in their motions. Um, so are these the right metrics for measuring robot behavior? Probably not, actually. But we don't have the right metrics. That's really the problem here. So I think from a scientific perspective, we don't really know how to evaluate these sort of systems well. Um, a lot of it tends to be subjective a lot of times. We'll ask users, did you like the robot? Um, and as you'll see later, actually, that didn't work out so well either. Um, so in addition to evaluating robot behavior, we also evaluated human behavior uh, quantitatively within the context of robot navigation. Um, and so we hypothesized that humans in close proximity to the robots would follow the lowest acceleration paths when the robot runs social momentum. So the reasoning for this is that the social momentum agent is trying to be very legible about how it's going to avoid. And so you get less of this kind of last minute uh, dodging sort of acceleration. And this really, I think, is a desirable trait. You don't want people to be confused or baffled by the robot. Um, the third one is this more subjective, qualitative uh, measure. Uh, we looked at a whole bunch of different uh, metrics, uh, intelligence, compliance, safety, um, from the perspective of the users. So here's a... A uh, quick clip of it, of one turn. There's sort of a industry noise in the background just to make it seem real. But uh, basically, it's synchronized. So the robot will make a noise, and then they all move, and then the robot will make a noise. So, so we were able to observe a whole bunch of these interactions in a short amount of time. So we had uh, 105 participants done three at a time like that. Um, it was all students, but um, a pretty, pretty decent spread of population within that student body. Um, so I think we can argue that at least sort of for a campus environment, this represents a good uh, cross-section of, of um, capability. Um, so let's look at our, our uh, experimental results. So hypothesis one was all of these uh, quantitative numbers of robot performance. And we see, uh, firstly, path irregularity is a measure of how much did the path deviate from the shortest or like start to goal distance. Um, and, and just as we predicted, ORCA deviates much less than the other two. Interestingly, teleoperation and social momentum look very similar in terms of path irregularity. So they're both deviating by the same amount. Um, second one is acceleration. And here we see social momentum accelerates the most because it's going in these arcs. Uh, teleoperation was a little bit less, and then ORCA, uh, but the least. Uh, and then the third one is, is robot energy expenditure. And the teleoperation was significantly less energy usage than the other two. Um, and, and this, I think, it, it appears to be echoing this point that humans are optimizing jerk. But also, I think there's something deeper going on, which is the paths that were generated by the human teleoperator were also topologically less complex. Um, and that means they were less entangled with the, the human users. Um, and, and the way that we interpret that is that people, when they move, are actually planning more steps ahead than what the robot was able to do. So the robot is sort of engaging with only the next person that's going to pass and then the next one. And humans, it seems, might be planning maybe two or three steps ahead. And so they're able to get more globally optimal trajectories out of this. And that also minimizes energy. Um, OK, human behavior. Um, so this one was, was measuring how people behaved in the presence of the robot. 
Uh, and as we expected, people did accelerate least around the social momentum uh, robot, but not by a, as big of a degree. It was, it was significant, but not huge. Um, and so this is confirmed as well. Uh, the third one, we, we ran the, um, the Godspeed uh, metric with some, some extra questionnaire, some extra questions at the end that we added on. Um, and 201, everything came back negative, actually. There was no significant difference between the three, uh, three versions. So it, it was within subjects. So everybody saw all three versions. Um, and this surprised us a little bit that people just weren't distinguishing subjectively uh, among them. But maybe it says that they're all doing a pretty good job, or maybe it says that we're just measuring the wrong things. I think that's still an open question here. Um, so I think that there's, I mean, this is sort of, I mean, we tried to do a good job with our user study, and, and we'll be presenting it at the HRI conference in a couple of weeks. But um, user studies are really hard <laughs> to do well. Uh, you learn a lot about what you did wrong every time you do one. Um, and it seems to be sort of an art form that some people do really well. And, and uh, I think that one of the things that we can take away from this is, is how to make them more scientific in terms of transferring that knowledge of how to design a good one and what are the, the right metrics to be using and the right baselines and so on. Yeah. Did you look at the complexity of the paths chosen by the, the humans in the environment? Like, so we, were they choosing kind of less entangled paths? Is, is it like the same with the teleoperated robot was? Or? Um, it's hard to answer that question because the Topological complexity is measured on the braid, so it's all four of them entangled. Um, so, right. okay, so that's and like it's the same problem. human for all three baselines. Right. So you can't really say that uh, the human was less entangled. You would say that, I mean, the, the variable that changed was the, the planner changed, right. and, and that seemed to correlate with more or less entanglement. Yeah, I was just wondering, because I feel like maybe if I'm driving a teleoperative robot, mm -hmm. I might be giving people more yeah. feedback. Like, I'm not going to go right through the middle yeah. of things. Where exactly. if I'm there in person, I can maybe right. navigate. Yeah, for anyone who's never driven a beam or one of these robots, it, it, peripheral vision is gone. But even more, just your sense of space is skewed because it's sort of a fisheye lens. So if you see two people standing in the hallway talking, you don't know whether it would be rude to cut between them or if you have to go around. It's, it's quite difficult. Um, I'm curious how you think of how this model scales as the number of robots in the environment increases. Right. So for example, with one robot, people are conforming more to human standards. And as that sort of shifts to the robotic side, how do you expect that behavior mm -hmm. to be modeled? Yeah. So this is a complicated question. I've thought about, for example, uh, Shibuya crosswalk outside the train station in, in Shibuya neighborhood of Tokyo, busiest crosswalk in the world, supposedly. Uh, each time the light turns, you get maybe a thousand people crossing the street. It's a very big number. Uh, that is a very different kind of multi-agent collision avoidance problem than what we're talking about uh, for two reasons. One is that you get emergent behaviors. There's flow patterns, and, and so it actually becomes much easier than dodging a thousand objects. Um, and the second one is you're not actually interacting with a thousand people at once. Um, there's a notion called civil inattention uh, which is the idea that you're ignoring somebody not to be rude, but just because that's what's socially called for at the moment. And so when you're passing by somebody, you're going to make eye contact with them, and then you break it. Right? And then you make eye contact with someone else, and you break it. And that's actually signaling, like, OK, negotiation is open right now with you and not with other people. And then when I decide I'm going to pass on this side, I break eye contact to say, I know what I'm going to do. If you don't like it, tough luck. It's your problem. Uh, but I'm just going to. I'm going to commit. And this is actually necessary for scalability to, to give stability. Right? You can't have, a crowd of 1,000 people can't be moving stably if they're all constantly reacting to, to what everyone's doing. Um, so we're not modeling, modeling those kind of mechanisms in this. We do a simple form of it where after you pass somebody, they disappear from the braid uh, or from the, the winding number. They just don't get considered. But I think the, the reality is a little more sophisticated. So you're really engaging with one or two people at a time. So was that what you were asking? Well, so more towards like as the number, like let, let's say there's 10 people in the environment and mm -hmm. you're slowly replacing those people with robots. So the oh, interaction in So if you had nine robots and yeah, one person. Yeah. So will they conform yeah. to 
that Orca's model for robotics? <laughs> I've not run that experiment. I don't know <laughs> what would happen. Um, I mean, you could ask Amazon, I guess they might. I don't think those robots are even aware of people, so. Um, no, I, I don't know if anyone has really looked at that question of how the proportion alters the social dynamics. Uh, my personal view is that, that humans have built-in algorithms already to solve all kinds of multi-agent distributed planning problems and that robots should be running those algorithms as well as possible, right? So if I build my robot correctly, you shouldn't notice any change as you add more robots to the scene. Um, but we don't know how to do that yet. Yeah. So the what you just mentioned about gaze and breaking gaze and all this like makes me think of so in the in this model it seems like communication is basically implicit by virtue of observing trajectories. Yes. But that's about it. That's right. Like I was wondering, are you guys doing work on extending that? Like the mm -hmm. idea you just presented about like you know like there's there's multiple other layers probably that come into communicating about trajectories besides right. observing. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, so I think gaze is probably, I, I think actually gross body motion is the strongest signal uh -huh. because you can see somebody, you know, 30 meters down a hallway and, and you can pick up on a very slight deviation in their heading and you respond to that. Uh, you can't even see what their eyes are doing at that distance. Um, and I think the state of, of, you know, our ability to, to do eye gaze is just not as advanced as that. Um, but I do think that would be the next modality to look at. Um, for the for the just this body motion mm -hmm. stuff, like at least it seems to me. Correct me if I'm wrong. From the way the model is formulated, is that there's no it kind of comes in implicitly. Like it feels you're treating the whole trajectory, the whole existing path as an object. Like isn't, you're not like reifying individual kind of things as communicative acts. As like oh, right. this meant something. Right. So there's a do huge. Do you think that could give you anything, or do you yes. think? Okay. So sometimes you'll see people do this. Right. right. What does that mean? It right. means I forgot something and went back for right. it. Right. Right. So, so turning around is a very legible act. Right. Uh, but what we're not doing here is we're not segmenting the path. Right. You're not symbolizing. Um, you're not kind of. Yeah. And I have no idea how to do that. <laughs> I would love to hear your thoughts, no. but uh, that's future work. Uh, but it's something that needs to happen. I think it, when you look at something like IKEA assembly, where the actions are very discrete. You know, I hand you a thing. I screw in a thing. Like there's a continuous section to it, but then it it starts and it's done. As compared with navigation, where it's really you know you can be walking for an hour and that's one act in a way, uh, unless you break it up. And and then the question becomes how and when do you break it up, socially speaking? Right? You you can break it up in terms of velocity and maybe oh I stop for a crosswalk, does that mean that I'm now doing a different action? It's unclear. Um, all right. Uh, I have one different, one more section. I think I don't, I don't know how we're doing for time, but um, okay. Uh, this one is quicker. So did I kill my clicker? Okay. So I want to talk a little bit about implicit communication, and this is actually popping up a level and trying to generate a broad framework uh, to describe all possible implicit communication with the idea of being action action oriented. It's not just here's some information, but here's something that matters to you for the task. Um, so this is based on a paper that we presented at HRI a couple of years ago. Um, and the idea is, say we have a human and a robot, they each have some private information. So you can think of this as just a, a knowledge base, right? A collection of facts. Um, and they also have some shared context, right? So there's the context of the stuff in front of them. Uh, there's other common knowledge. You know, the sky is blue. There, there's a lot of knowledge in there, some of which may be relevant and a lot of which is not. Um, in particular, though, one thing that's, that's particularly relevant is how to do functional actions. So if I want to accomplish screwing in, what are the actions that would do that? Uh, and then a probability distribution over those actions given some, some collection of facts, right? So this thing, it's very hard to write down because you'd have to parameterize it in all combinations of facts. Um, but mathematically, we can just write that and, and it's, it's nice and simple. Uh, and it, it nicely unifies a lot of the stuff that I've been talking about. So the human has some fact that he wants to convey, and rather than just saying it, he chooses to encode it on top of an action. So he's going to pick an action that will convey the fact, right? And then he's going to do the action instead. 
the robot will observe the action and it's going to decode the message, right? It's going to get back m hat given that it saw a hat. Um, and so in the end, if everything went smoothly, then they both know the fact. And even though it was, it's not in the common ground because they don't both know that they both know that they both know, et cetera, uh, they both know that they know it. And so that uh, goes in the context. So it's these two uh, functions, generation and understanding, that I'm going to focus on right here. Um, and the mechanism for this is fundamentally is, is teleological reasoning, uh, which is described by Sieber and Gergely. And this is the idea that human, the human brain connects action and goal. And if we see one, we reason about the other. And this goes both ways. Uh, so Dragan and Srinivasa coined terms. Uh, we'd say that an action is predictable if you know the goal and you can predict that action from it. And we would say that an action is legible if from observing that action you can predict the goal. Right? So the reverse. And this is really the key concept here if we're going to be doing implicit communication. So again, very high level model, but suppose that we have a, a space of possible actions you can perform. They could be discrete or continuous. And we have some probability distribution. So given the common ground, <coughs> um, we have a, a likelihood of observing each of those actions in the current context. Uh, most of the time, you're going to see the, the most likely action. right? Uh, and we'd call that a predictable action, unsurprisingly. Uh, but occasionally, somebody will do something that surprises you. And you don't, the human brain does not just say, oh, that's a fluke. It's some weird thing. right? You immediately start asking yourself, why did this unlikely action occur? Uh, and that's what makes it a legible action. And fundamentally, that asking that question is about searching for a hidden fact. right? If I knew m hat to be true, then the shape of the distribution would change in a way that made that action become predictable. Right? Uh, so really, the difference is, is not about whether the action itself was one or the other, but whether the fact is true or not. Um, and so if we can find that, that correct fact, then we can deduce that this, that this that must be true, given that we saw this action. So the understanding problem we can formulate as searching over the space of possible facts, given that we saw this action in context, uh, and trying to maximize that. Now, the form that we said that we knew was this way. So we need to use Bayes' rule to flip it around. And Bayes' rule gives us this prior term in the end. And this is actually important because this is preventing conspiracy theories. So if this explanation were really unlikely, then we're going to ch tend not to choose it uh, when we're trying to understand why we saw what we saw. From the generation side, you'll notice the form looks very similar, but now we're searching over the space of possible actions we can perform to convey the fact m hat. And again, putting it into the standard form, we notice that Bayes' rule gives us now a ratio. right? So the probability of seeing the action given that the fact is true over the probability of seeing the, the action without that fact being true. And the way that you interpret that is we want to maximize the rise. Right? If we find the action that makes that rise the biggest, that's going to be the most legible. It's the strongest signal that you can send to the observer. Now, I mentioned that these two are the same, right? the same form, except for what we're argmaxing over. Uh, and that's not coincidence. Because the goal of both understanding and generation is the same. So whether you're the uh, actor or the observer, you're trying to maximize the confidence of the observer. Right? So earlier, there is that example I showed where the robot said, please help me. That's what you get if the robot is trying to generate natural language that is a help request that maximizes its own confidence rather than the confidence of the listener. Um, so it's not very useful, <laughs> right? It may, you know, it may be 99% sure that it wants the white leg on the table, but there's still that doubt, and so it'll choose something else. Um, I'm by no means the first person to do this. I'm the first person to, to recognize, actually, that all of these uh, different special cases are the same uh, framework, uh, as far as I know. Um, and I think there's a lot of power in looking at this framework um, and we've used that in this case uh, in our lab to, to produce this demo where the uh, Will asks the robot to hand him the soldering iron and then interrupts it with saying it's hot and a gesture, right? These are very ambiguous things, but in context, it's clear. 
So the robot needed to understand the context, and it needed to reason about those likelihoods in order to, to do the correct thing. Uh, similarly here, Julia is going to, to give a two-handed signal and say it's heavy. And Baxter is able to correctly interpret that that means use a two-handed grasp to lift the tool box. Um, and again, this is something that out of context, you might have no idea what it's heavy means. right? But the takeaway is these are very human ways of signaling to change the way that you're grasping something. right? People don't say, please add a constraint to your grasp selection metric, metric to exclude the tip which is what Will was saying in the first example. Uh, that's what the robot needed to know fundamentally, and that's what it did once it decoded the implicit communication. But if you see the robot about to hurt itself, you're going to say it's hot. right? So I think this is something the robot need to have. Um, so now we're in the home stretch. Uh, I want to reflect a little bit on how all of this inference works, because very deep down, there's, there's some unifying ideas. Um, so there's three kinds of inference. This was from C.S. Peirce, 1901. Uh, deduction is what you learn in school. Uh, A implies B, you know, powering off results in missing data. And I know that I was powered off, therefore I have missing data. So this is sort of traditional logical reasoning. Um, secondly, induction. I was powered off and I have missing data. Maybe, therefore, powering off resulted in my missing data. Right? Um, this is what machine learning and Bayesian inference and all, all statistical techniques are basically doing. Um, so we see a lot of both of these in computation. Uh, what we don't see so much is the third one, abductive inference. So this is the idea A implies B and B, therefore A. Um, and it sounds curious at first, but this is actually what was going on in the video I just showed you. Um, inference to the best explanation, right? Um, this is a this is a human survival skill. If you're you know in the woods and something's growling behind a bush, you're gonna guess. Well, it's probably a tiger. You're gonna run away, right? Um, and this is something that robots are gonna need to learn to do uh, if they're going to exist among people. Um, so I guess I'll just run through this quickly. The comparison between the sort of Bayes filter perspective on things versus the so-called abductive filter, which is really scientific method. Uh, you have some prior distribution, you make an observation, and you get a posterior. Abduction is going to say, OK, best explanation is the highest probability. That's our hypothesis. Being a good scientist, though, we need to confirm our hypothesis by exposing it to tests. So we're going to make a new observation, which is different. Uh, a Bayes filter is just going to give you another distribution, no more certainty. Um, and now we have a hypothesis and some evidence that sort of supports it and sort of doesn't, and we need to make a judgment call. Are we going to accept or reject the hypothesis? Right? That's the scientific method, and that's what robots ought to be doing in these human interaction scenarios. And just to bring it back home, right? when we're talking about group uh, decision making, it's this discrete nature. It's either I wanted to go through the middle or I wanted to go on the right side. Uh, and, and it's important because minor perturbations in the shape of your trajectory can't destabilize the, the group decision. Uh, so abductive inference, really, it's about rejecting noise a lot of times. So that when the robot has to deviate in response to what people are doing, it doesn't cause mass confusion about how it plans to get through the room. Um, and that brings us back to this observation that the granularity of team actions tends to be discrete. So this is actually for good reason. All right, I've reached the end. So this is uh, the, the end of our uh, westward journey. Uh, and I will close just by uh, bringing up the slide of this is what I, I hope that robotics academia, uh, robotics will go towards uh, in the coming decades and, and hopefully hand over more of the engineering -y sorts of tasks to industry, uh, which necessitates, I think, much better uh, communication between industry and, uh, and academia. So I'll close it out here. Thanks. So we had a lot of great questions already. So I don't know if there's anything else. I'm meeting several of you later anyway. Cool. Cool. Thank you so much for yes. having me. Yeah, thanks for coming. Are you going farther in the, like, kind of the, the last piece that you had? Like, like, are you kind of combining those worlds of the, the implicit actions 
that like a bad compiling framework yeah. for social navigation? Like, that, is that, that is the goal. Yeah. Um, and I think, like, in something I'll mention is that there was this in the video. Um, you see that it's multimodal. So I don't know if you saw there's a connect in the background. Yeah. Um, so it's actually watching the gesture while it's understanding the language and, and it's doing just bag of words. So it's nothing fancy, but it's actually combining these two things into a joint uh, embedding space where it can try to understand the meaning. Right. Um, I think it would be great to do that kind of thing for social navigation too and, and just throw, you know, eye gaze and and all these other things, just throw it all in there. Right, kind of like, yeah, like what yeah. Um, we haven't done that yet, though. Right. Cool. Awesome. Well, right. Thanks. For Thank you. Just going to take them down to over the comments.